Hi, welcome. I'm with Rob McClare. Can you tell me about your kind of goals for this legislative session? Hmm. Well, obviously, as you've probably gleaned, there is a lot of needs that we have in our state, and they always require money. And as much as we'd love to be able to meet them all, like with everything in life, it's all about priorities. So we're looking to see what, what the governor's priorities are, and in particular, how some of those priorities are going to be paid for. One of the things that a lot of us here, especially out there door-to-door -door talking to Vermonters, is the cost of living in Vermont, that it can be very, very expensive. Um, I've done a lot of door-to-door -to -door in my time, and I haven't had one person say to me, Rob, my taxes are too low, and the cost of living is too low in Vermont. Can you go do something about that? Um, we need to take a, a look at what we can do to you know, make Vermont more affordable, but also make it so that younger folks um, have the opportunities that they need and can have the sort of lifestyle that they would like in Vermont so that they can call Vermont home. And do you have any specific bills that you're keeping your eye on for this coming session? Well, you know, there's a lot of them out there in play. And of course, if you take each bill individually, it may not be that big of a deal. But when you take a look at everything that's out there, the cumulative effect can sometimes be quite a lot for businesses and Vermonters in general to take a look at. Um, most of them are all well intended. You know, the criteria I'm looking at is, you know, who's going to pay, what's it going to cost, and in particular, what's it going to look like? We've got programs out there that theoretically they looked one way, but in the real practical world, they were something different. Um, and in your role as WHIP, as you called it, how do you feel going into this most recent session? Are you feeling confident about it? Is it have you kind of come across some uh, inter, you know, house fighting? Well, I mean, you know, what you'll find is that there's more commonality than not in what the issues are. Where the difference of opinion will come is what are those p potential solutions. And of course, you know, like the paid family leave, for instance, conceptually, we don't disagree with that. <clears throat> Where we have the difference of opinion is how much of it should be mandated and how much of it, you know, what's it going to cost. Um, those are the kind of things that you want to take a look at and see, all right, um, theoretically we could support that, but again, who's going to pay, how much is it going to cost, and what's it going to really look like. Um, so what are you guys expecting to see from this, uh, like this legislative meeting today? The meeting today? Well, the what the governor's speech, I mean, talking about the governor, the governor's afternoon, well, he's going to lay out his budget. Um, I have heard that there's going to be uh, quite a bit in there uh, to do with economic development, uh, to addressing the problem of the democratic problems that we have in the state with uh, a, a sort of a de small decline in population, but a real loss in that 25 to 45 year olds. Um, so we really need to, if we don't grow the population and we don't grow the economy, we're not even going to be able to afford the social programs we have now, much less any new ones. So basically what Bob said, I mean it, the governor I think is is looking to grow population here to, to spread out the tax base, make Vermont more affordable. And uh, he's throwing out a couple of different things. Um, he did that uh, no tax uh, for the 26 year olds and then he went and he he see that that wasn't workable, so I think he's trying a different, a lot of different avenues uh, to make Vermont more affordable, to attract more people to come in here. So I anxiously await to, to see what he has to say. Um, and what are you two hoping to accomplish today? Um, uh, not much accomplished today. I'll, our, my committee is going to be hearing uh, some testimony on a couple of bills that we on tourism. And there's been a request for a half a million dollars of state funding for tourism so we're going to hear a little bit of that at one o'clock but then at um, a quarter or two we're going into the chamber uh, to listen to the uh, governor's uh, address and so that'll be afterwards it'll be interesting going through the booklet and seeing where his, what his proposals are and where he would like to see money spent. Uh, the, the governor's address is what I'm really focused on today uh, to see the affordability um, and what we could do to make adjustments and then I'll go right into um, really focusing on that and uh, seeing what he said and dissect it a little bit more um, in, our, in our house, I mean house judiciary and that's uh, 
dealing with uh, we're dealing with more domestic violence. That's we've already heard a lot of that about um, so far. So it's more it's more about the budget today for me. All right. So what are your hopes for this coming legislative session? Well, there are some things we didn't finish from the last session. Um, and one of them is paid family medical leave insurance. We'll be voting on that this week. Another is the minimum wage. We'll be voting on that probably next week or the week after. Uh, we'll also be doing, we also passed unanimously um, today Proposition 2, which is to uh, amend our Constitution to be sure that slavery and indentured servitude are no longer allowed in our Constitution. Wow, amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. So it was a, that was, a, it was a, uh, a moment to be humble about something that, um, that we needed to do. And then do you have any predictions for today's governor address, uh, the budget Well, address? I know that the governor mentioned last week having after-school program for children, which would be a great help for families so that they have somewhere healthy and safe for their children to be in school. I'm not sure that um, any, I'm not sure how uh, he is intending to say that should be paid for. So I'm looking for that in today's budget address. So what are you excited to hear today? Well, it's the it's the budget uh, message, and we all went to the budget. Some of us went to the briefing, so we actually know what the budget is, but I'm not allowed to tell you yet because it's embargoed till 2 o'clock. So, you know, a budget briefing is more fun than most parties. That's <laughs> not true, really. It's very dreary, but it was interesting. Was there anything in particular that you found interesting that you can say? No, I can't say because okay. it's all embargoed. Is this going off? When When is this going to be broadcast? A few days. Oh, well, well then I can say, yeah. Okay. Uh, they're gonna, no new taxes, no new fees, not much new spending, not many new initiatives, but they're proposing sports betting. Uh, I don't exactly know how it would work. In addition to just the lottery... Kino, and I guess you could place a bet on the Super Bowl or the World Series or something like that. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, about the budget uh, briefing, no, not much. It's uh, it, it looks like, I mean, it's a campaign year, and I think uh, the budget should be viewed partly as a political document. That's why there are no new taxes and no new fees, because that's Governor Scott's sort of political mantra. And what are you hoping to achieve today? Awareness of our duty and our needs, um, and awareness of the need to pass legislation to help the Ethics Committee Commission do a better job. That's great. I agree with what Larry said. We're also here sharing our code and some information about us, and our um, annual report is on the website that talks about some of the things that Larry was mentioning. I would just say that the, the role of the Ethics Commission in state government is we're brand new. Uh, we're only in our second year, and things are evolving, including awareness of ethics in government. And our hope is that we can do something to facilitate the process and raise awareness of ethics so that people in government are, have more uh, confidence. I, I didn't say that right. So that we have the confidence of the people we serve. Um, that really integrity in government depends on confidence of the people we represent. And if we behave ethically and we're aware of ethics and the people of Vermont know that we care about ethics, they'll have more faith in what we as government workers can do. So that's, that's my big message. And there are two pieces of legislation in committee now to that effect. So um, both in House and Senate government ops that people can follow um, to see what comes next for the Ethics Commission. And uh, what are you guys doing here today or like over the entire session? Well we're legislative pages so we um, deliver messages from uh, legisl legislators to e other legislators. Um, yeah. That's the main part of our job. We do most of passing notes, we do different errands um, for such as like bringing things to different people and yeah, stuff like that. We also sort mail in the coat room over there. There's a big box of mail, thing of mailboxes over there, and we do a lot of that too. <laughs> and are you guys here for the whole session or? 
Yeah, we're here. We yeah, just for the six weeks um, in the beginning. We started two weeks ago, and we end like um, February fourteenth in the beginning of February. And is this like affiliated with like school, or is this like just a volunteer work you guys are doing? We um, we applied through letters to the Sergeant of Arms, and then we were all selected. There's three sessions, so we we're just the first session. So it isn't really affiliated with schools. There's about 90 kids that apply um, this year statewide, um, and there's 30 kids that are selected for each year, and 10 per session, and we're the first session. Thanks. And what are you hoping to achieve today? today or well in this session um, I have several bills that I'm hoping to make some forward progress on um, one is we just got back a lot of information about the number of people in prison and um, many of them are there on furlough violations so I have a bill in the institutions and corrections committee to basically do away with sending people back to prison for furlough violations that aren't against the law or aren't relevant and I'm hoping that that will mean th the numbers are pretty high of how many people are in for that so ideally that will mean we're not going to send other prisoners out of state I have a bill in which I've had in for several sessions to stop doing business with for-profit prisons and um, we, we just keep hearing more and more about like new costs and the return on investment is awful so we would do better sending prisoners um, to college and getting them services and lower the rate other states help people in prison get job skills and um, help funding housing so that there's a chance they're going to be successful when they come out um, also, there's a new report out um, from a commission that looks at animals treatment and one thing that I was shocked to learn is that we do no regulating of like doggy daycares or other um, breeding and boarding places and I think most Vermonters don't realize that. So. I've been trying to, one, make sure Vermonters know that, but two, bring back some standards and accountability because there are some, um, especially breeders, that are not treating animals the way they should be treated. Um, another issue that I'm very passionate about and would love to hear from any of your viewers is the towing issue. Vermont has a really bizarre um, law where if your car gets towed, and um, you don't come to find it, they can, within 28 days, go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and um, take over your title of your car. So if people don't keep their addresses current with um, their driver's license, which I know a lot of people don't, especially students who move a lot, it's expensive every time you do that, you won't get the letter saying that they're gonna keep your car. And then if they do keep your car, they sell the car and the proceeds of everything inside your car and you get none of the money. The towers keep all the money, the state doesn't get the money. So it's a perverse um, incentive. We have a lot of trolling of um, towing trucks in Burlington. So they'll just go out and look for cars that are parked in places without complaints. And it's not regulated. So you could be charged incredible fees for storage and towing. And some people don't have that money. So in Chittenden County alone, um, two years ago, over 200 people permanently lost their cars, which is horrible. And so that really needs to be stopped. So those are just a few of the bills that um, I've been working on. And I would love to hear if anybody does have a towing story that's affected them or a friend or relative to share that with me and they can do that through um, my email at the legislature. So is there um, any anything that you're like hoping to see today? I know you don't know today or or this whole let us legislative well, session. Let's back up a little bit or go forward or whatever I mean um, um, climate the climate crisis is certainly high on my mind you know all the time and I can also say then 
The question is, how do we how do we get to solutions? Where's the money come from? Where's our participation come from? One thing that's clear from the protests that have been here last year and this year is there seems to be I there seems to be an attitude on some of those that protest that if we'd only pass this law or that law and the governor would sign it that everything would be better. But in fact, it doesn't work like that. And in, in many cases, it's individual participation in what we do outside the state house that makes as much a difference as what um, legislation we pass here. Ask a question, and which maybe gets people to think, why is a Facebook post like a plastic straw? Got a clue? Um, probably because you, know, you throw it out there and nothing really happens with it. Never disappear. Plastics in the environment forever. You know, in the oceans, landfills here, da 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 da. Facebook posts, you post something on Facebook, maybe it's noteworthy or maybe it's frivolous, and it ends up in a data farm forever. And they have to be maintained, they have to be cooled, they use incredible amounts of electricity. So ask yourself, all of us, and these silly little things that we do, pardon, I'm being a little sarcastic here. Um, uh, but but much of our individual behavior is as much uh, important as what goes on on the House floor or in the Senate. So those things con concern me uh, quite a bit. And how we get from here to there, meaning a solution where we all participate, that is a big question. Um, are there any like smaller steps that, like, because I hadn't even thought about like the Facebook thing and the energy no, used to. Really? Um, so smaller steps. Um, um, buy local, drive less. Um, most of the stuff that we collectively buy is produced on the Pacific Rim. You know, India, China, Bangladesh, in uh, factories that are largely run on electricity from carbon um, belching, you know, carbon, excuse me, um, coal fired power plants. So just I'm not sure, I'm, I'm back on my same theme I was on a minute ago, but um, smaller steps, well, there's a lot of things we can do. I mean, we'll do what we can to incent electric car purchases and use, you know. Um, I build right over here on the wall, right, that's me. But that's a high efficiency house that Habitat for Humanity built in Sharon Lest, well, it took us nearly a year. 12-inch um, wall, thick walls, 24 inches of insulation above the ceiling, and, and probably can be heated, the, est the owners think, for maybe 20 bucks a month for um, maybe more. Let's say 25. Um, cold water heat pumps. Cold weather heat pumps, right? So uh, um, there's things that, that all of us collectively should be doing all the time to consider how we use electricity, how we use energy, where it comes from. And, um, and let's get with the program, you know, let's really get going. And can you tell us a little bit about your legislative priorities? Sure. Um, climate action. We need to do something about climate change. Um, that's my number one priority area. Um, I, I signed on to the Climate Solutions Act, which is going to basically, it's an accountability bill more than anything. It's basically giving citizens the right to uh, sue the state if we don't uphold our commitment to uh, the, the timelines and the goals that we set forth uh, as to carbon emissions reductions. So um, in, that, in that respect, I also have been on the, on the ground level in the district trying to corral support for, uh, for a petition for town meeting day, a resolution um, that says the town of Randolph the town in which I live, uh, expects the state of Vermont to stay committed to the, the goals that the, I think it was two legislatures or three legislatures ago, maybe six years ago, they voted on um, making, making sure that the state tries to be, uh, what is it, 90% renewable by 2050. Um, turns out we're going in the opposite direction. Our carbon emissions are climbing. Um, that's... That's not acceptable, in my opinion. So, uh, great. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I think this TCI bill is going to be different from what the Republicans are calling it. They're 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 
labeling it a carbon tax, I think though it does probably have some language in the policy that uh, would perhaps influence fuel prices, um, maybe making them go up. I think it's a, it's a tax and invest program instead of a tax, a, 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 um, excuse me, a cap and invest program, not a tax and a cap and invest program, not a cap and trade program. So a carbon tax is where you create a marketplace for uh, trading carbon credits. And I actually have some issues with that because uh, I think it's not good to encourage businesses, well not encourage, but allow businesses to basically purchase the right to pollute. Um, so I'm not a big carbon tax fan. I don't, I actually, uh, I'm kind of in a sticky spot on that topic because the, uh, the voters in my district asked me to commit to voting against a carbon tax on my first campaign and uh, even even along my second my re-election campaign so I'm, I'm kind of in a position where I have to respect that um, but this TCI bill tar this is called a um, transportation car a climate initiative it's not a it's not a carbon tax so I, I'm really weighing on on whether or not I can support that and uh, I hope to but um, I'm not certain. I gotta, we got to see how it goes. Great. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Um, back to the Education Committee. So can All you right. tell me a bit about what you're doing here today? Well, we are up here pretty much on a daily basis because the legislature is the entity that gives towns authority to do anything that they can do in, in the state of Vermont. We're what's called a Dillon's Rural State. So you can, as a local government, you can only do those things that the legislature has given you permission to do. So we follow about 300 bills during the course of a session on all kinds of topics that affect local government. And do you have any specific bills that you're looking at for this go around? Well, absolutely. We're always looking at the education funding issues and how much it costs to pay for secondary education pre-K through 12, as well as what the funding is. The bulk, the bulk of funding comes from an education property tax, so that's an issue for local governments. We're looking at the climate uh, adaptation, climate um, resiliency legislation up in the House Energy Committee. We're looking at some affordable housing legislation that's down in the Senate Economic Development Committee. We always look at public safety and law enforcement issues, and um, we're, we're very concerned about the um, ability to actually get volunteers and emergency medical technicians to serve in Vermont. We have a big problem with volunteering for those kinds of jobs. We're um, very interested in E911 and um, how the, how the, um, that whole system and dispatch and um, calling for service is handled in the state of Vermont and what needs to happen around that. It's a pretty antiquated system right now, so there's a lot of proposals around those kinds of issues. And I could keep going, but I won't. <laughs> Um, do you have any predictions today for the governor's budget address? Well, I think he'll be um, restrained as he has been in the past. He's very concerned about our uh, image outside of the state because we have a priority of trying to attract people to the state. So I think he'll be pretty careful. We have a uh, close to $80 million or maybe over $80 million surplus on the books right now over projections and how that gets spent or whether it gets spent and what it what it gets directed to is really going to be what he's talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about your legislative priorities? Well, I am the uh, vice chair of the House Education Committee. So my legislative priorities are dealing with uh, really serious issues like literacy, um, school uh, safety of course, we're very concerned about that. Um, we have uh, many bills that were put on our board today for example that will <clears throat> um, be probably discussed at some point during our session but right now we're really kind of looking at literacy bill um, pretty seriously. It'll be a committee bill. And what are you hoping to achieve with that? Well, we want to, my goal in, in uh, 
this bill would be to take uh, kindergarten through third grade students and make sure that we test them for dyslexia so that we can serve them now rather than having them go through special education um, courses throughout their 12 year uh, school uh, time. So catching children early is very, very important. So this literacy bill will probably um, most likely come out of our committee as a committee bill and we will address these uh, issues now rather than having to wait until these kids start having difficulties and failing their grades mm -hmm. um, in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, freshman, sophomore, junior high school. It's just dyslexia is a neurological issue. I think we all understand it's very hard to to uh, determine sometimes, but special educators, good teachers can really bring forward the problem and they can fix it.